Welcome everyone to the first of a series of uh, three um, uh, sessions and webinars on uh, value chain analysis. Today, uh, Zoe and Amira and myself will be talking about how to perform a value chain analysis for tax and transpising. And we, uh, we will start, kick off with, uh, with the agenda. If you can show the next slide. So we will pull you from, through some uh, VCA definitions. Uh, we'll take uh, a, a short uh, introduction on where you can find all of this in the OECD guidelines and other references. Then we will uh, uh, take you through the journey we typically go through when we do these value chain analysis and understanding the critical success factors of the in, in the industry relevant in the industry and for your company in particular. And then we will throw a couple of visualization techniques to, to illustrate what, what is happening then. And uh, last but not least, we will also alert you on the, the two upcoming webinars, uh, which are planned in April and May, which uh, talk about VCA 2.0 and 3.0. And we explain that in a, in a bit. So if we move to the next slide, uh, there's a short video we already posted online, but it would be good because it gives you an, an impression of what value chain analysis does. So take it away, uh, Mari. So this is the, probably the shortest version uh, you can possibly rely on, uh, where we, we say the board has all autonomy, uh, delegates that to actors in the value chain and wants a reporting line back. Uh, so this is all about, uh, this uh, webinar is all about connecting uh, your strategy and business model and governance uh, in one visualized balloon, as you saw just in the, at the end of the movie, of the short movie, uh, with your tax and, and transfer pricing setup. And basically, we consider VCA to be the dynamic link between the two worlds. So if one world changes, VCA will keep you on track on tax and transfer pricing. Um, if you need to change your transfer pricing and, and uh, and uh, tax setup, it needs to talk to uh, the other balloon, again, uh, strategy, business model, and governance uh, on a one-to-one. -one. And this is sort of the after BAPS world, but it's uh, it's been used uh, in a universal way already for a longer period. So let's move to the next slide and start with the definitions. Uh, we have a poll question for this slide. I'm going to launch oh, it and let everybody participate. Go ahead, Sami. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, they're voting now. Gonna wait a minute. So this is a question to the audience uh, who, who's already using it. Yes, what is the relevance of VCA in your tax and TP practice? Yeah, and just um, to uh, to also deal with uh, with this, uh, we started VCA long time ago uh, when it was called business process analysis. Uh, that was a very subjective version of the VCA. Uh, there's an other version in 2017 we started, which was more based on BAPS. And this 2023 relaunch of VCA should be seen as the first mature version more mature version uh, hitting the market and, and also being in the full spotlights of tax authorities. Are we uh, um, closing in on? on yeah, 60% have participated. I'm going to end it now. 
So 41% currently in the, can place. We, can we see the outcome? Of course, yeah, sharing the results. Okay, this is quite interesting. So people have been following the same trend as, as I just explained. They probably after BEP started looking into value chain analysis, 41%, uh, that's interesting. And, and there's a majority, actually half of the audience is uh, considering it and, and other people are still in doubt whether VCA is of any relevance uh, to them, which is uh, a legitimate question uh, I get asked on a daily basis. Zoe, any observations from your end? Yeah, it would be interesting to have the discussion and uh, see what are the showstoppers um, that prevent people from using VCA already and uh, what are the elements they're considering at the moment. Um, also, uh, what are the benefits the VCA can bring to the tax and the TP practice? And then let's have a look at the result after the, the webinar. Yep. So yep. Thanks, Amir. This is a good yeah. start. Um, so value chain definition, um, it's the um, entire pro performance process of a company. Uh, there's no, uh, the word you know should be fat here as well, there's no 100% objective mm -hmm. method. Um, so, so as I just explained uh, in the, in the pre baps period, it was highly subjective. In the 2017 version, it became more objective. I think we're now closing into uh, 70, 80% of objectivity being being weaved into uh, VCA solutions and analysis. So this, this is what a lot of people who are non-believers tell me, oh, I tried it and it didn't work. And, and they were right at, <clears throat> at that moment in time. But uh, I think they might be wrong if you look at the maturity PCA analysis is, uh, is in, in today's world. Um, we've been running 15 VCAs from 2017 onwards quite successfully, and we, we addressed that a little later. So it starts with identifying the value chain within the industry, then the value creating activities within the company. Uh, it should contain evidence in the relevant context. Huh? The, prices, margins, uh, there, there is a mark to market uh, in a lot of cases. And even if you use profit splitters, they need to come with some degree of objectivity and relevance. Um, the, the terminology we use these days is uh, to, to avoid confusion. VCA 1.0 is a qualitative version, like a visualization of your own value chain or the one in the industry. VCA 2.0 is the quantitative version of your value chain, uh, which is based on the data from your own multinational. Um, uh, you, you probably can refer to table one of your country by country reporting, although a lot of people disqualify that as a relevant quantitative data set. It sort of visualizes what VCA 2.0 is doing. And 3.0 is adding the data from the whole industry. And, and if you add the data from the whole industry, you can apply statistics to it, which gives you a more objective way and direction on what are the relevant profit splitters, especially on your residual profit you're splitting. So this is just from a de definitional point of view, I think relevant for, uh, for the, the, the session of today. If we move to the next slide, it, it visualizes why uh, and where do we use VCA? Uh, you can design your tax and TP system with VCA. You can implement it uh, like operational transfer pricing. You can document it, which is in the mind of most people. Um, these days we, we are running VCA, VCA's, uh, uh, VCA's analysis in controversy cases, uh, potentially heading courts uh, soon. Um, and and what, what is most important is that VCA does establish a holistic link between, on one side, strategy, business, and even governance, uh, uh, where, where it connects, it, it is a dynamic link to your tax and TP uh, um, setup. So this is important because uh, as we, we might know, transfer pricing is typically based on a transactional approach, the transaction of flow of goods. 
Um, you have the flow of services and your flow of intangibles, which drive your EBIT. Um, but that is always looking at the isolated transactional uh, flow and tries to put a, 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 a check the box uh, beneath, um, uh, behind each of the transactional transfer pricing flows. Uh, what VCA is doing uh, is if the data is of a quality, uh, good enough nature, VCA is adding a corroborative check whether the, that allocation by the transactional transfer pricing is indeed in line with, uh, with the value chain analysis. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think uh, value chain analysis give a more straightforward picture uh, to help uh, the audience to identify and understand the, va the various components of the value chain and how they contribute to the value creation process. And um, by doing so, uh, companies can evaluate whether their TP and tax policy they put in place a fair, transparent, and in line with the value creation process. Uh, also, uh, very helpful to how to design and implement the, the new structures as close as possible to business. Yeah, that's that's what basically BAPS has created. Huh? There's no delta anymore in the business, between business reality and tax and TP reality. So that's what uh, this uh, VCA as a linking pin is, is also achieving. We move yeah. to the next slide or we have a poll again, uh, Amir? Not, not yet, I believe. Not yet. Uh, okay. So, where do we get all this this VCA uh, language from? Um, fairly simple. Uh, there is two steps in VCA. If you have the total profit pie and you need to slice it in pieces, that is called the quantification. So if, for example, the total profit is uh, 100 and uh, you, um, you want to quantify what portion of the total profit, global profit, goes into sales and marketing, and you find enough evidence to say it's 25%, that's your step one. So that's the quantification step. Uh, a, a second step is if 25% of your global profit is linked to sales and marketing, you still need to allocate it to the 40 sales and marketing uh, entities involved in sales and marketing. Uh, which are in 40 different locations. So uh, VCA is really about step one, quantification, step two, allocation. And, and uh, the way we uh, have cross-referenced it to OECD, which is very important, uh, and there is a degree of overlap with residual profits, uh, residual profit split, but the technique is slightly different. So we, we have looked at uh, BAPS reports action eight to 10, which we basically used uh, for our 2017 cycle of VCAs we've been performing. Um, but also all of those VCA references were being translated in the 17 and, and one, not one-on-one, -on -one, but also in the 2022 guidelines, that's explicit references. If you take a quantification step, the 25% allocated to your sales and marketing should be based on objective data. It should be based on comparable data. It should be, uh, it should rely on economically significant functions, assets, and risks. Um, uh, and the relative contribution by the parties to that value driver. And then it should also, and this is where a little bit of the statistical element comes in, there should be a strong and relative consistent correlation between the variable and the, the, the creation um, uh, of, of the profits. So the variable could be seen as the independent variable uh, which drives the dependent variable EBIT or operating margin. So this is the quantification step. Uh, to a large extent, the, the allocation keys, so step two, do follow suit on that, on that uh, uh, four, four criteria uh, laid down in the OECD guidelines. So it should be objective data when you allocate it to the 40 sales and marketing entities, it should be 
uh, uh, supplemented on how you allocate it to those territories by external market data. Yeah, so what is the, the relevant allocation key here? Uh, the, rel the relevant allocation key should be uh, a good matrix for the relative contribution of those 40 entities. And again, a strong correlation between allo allocation keys and value created. Uh, so in, in short, we have eight uh, uh, criteria to assess whether our VCA we're going to be using is sort of valid within the context of the OEC guidelines. And uh, on, the, on the right end, there is uh, an illustration of a scoring model. The sc what the scoring model is doing, it, it sort of defines whether the, the quality and quantity of data I have available and, and uh, the, the, the measured against the eight uh, criteria is strong enough and leads to a very, uh, a very valid VCA. I can use corroborative to my transactional transfer pricing or even becoming the prevailing uh, concept to slice the pie of profit uh, or whether I have a VCA which is uh, based on poor data, not enough data, not a, enough objective data. I can't find the external market references. Uh, I can't do the uh, due to lack of data points, it's a statistical analysis to um, to support the profit splitters I'm using for my residual, and, and therefore the VCA falls flat or is not mature enough uh, to be used uh, for uh, for purposes of reporting. So, if I would uh, in this uh, in this score. Uh, confirm my quantification step is all in line with these criteria. So I have a score of four out of four um, and the allocation keys is a four out of four. I can see the VCS as equally relevant uh, to the transactional transfer pricing. Obviously if the score, uh, the average score is two, so I make a three score on quantification and one score on the uh, on allocation keys, my average of two probably doesn't support the VCAs being used for already tax reporting uh, purposes as, uh, as indicated. And then you still would fall back on your transactional transfer pricing approach. So this is one illustration. Eh? There's a couple of scoring models, but this is a uh, fairly simple, fairly straightforward, and very much locked into what the OECD already has published, and, and therefore can also be conveyed simply as a message to uh, to the tax inspector. Zoe, any any points or move on? Yeah, let's move on. Um. So there's a couple of countries, and this is just a selection of uh, where we find VCA coming back. So take uh, Germany. There's in the in the resolution, uh, Germany has recently published. There's a lot of references to global value chain and how to slice the pie. In Israel, there's a special resol uh, a special uh, resolution published by the Israeli tax authorities on. Um, the slicing of the pie in case of business restructuring. Um, in uh, in, in uh, the UK, there is a, sp a special need to get into a VCA description if you enter into the area of, uh, of uh, uh, filing for an APA. And in South Africa, there is, uh, there is even a, a law which um, makes it mandatory to slice the pie on a transactional base. So if South Africa has a mine and has a sales office, uh, say in Switzerland, uh, and it has a logistic department somewhere else, then per transaction, this law in South Africa requires you to do a value chain, a value creation analysis and report it to, to SARS. So they, they went all the way to get, uh, to get transparency on that full chain. Um, the OECD, the UN and the EU, the EU in particular, so the UN and OECD following the uh, OECD 
anchors we just uh, eight criteria we just looked at the OECD is clear the UN is has a few references but is not that explicit as OECD so that means there's still uh, there's still a gap in perception maybe and what UN members uh, versus OECD members will expect the EU obviously has published quite a lot of um, um, comments on profit splitters and what are the relevant profits four or five categories of profit splitters you can actually be pulling in uh, to uh, to slice the pie as we, we we're doing it here uh, mostly in the light of explanation on how to apply a residual profit split but uh, in, in essence the splitters do uh, also come back to the allocation keys we uh, and the criteria around the allocation keys we just uh, we just went into already so in in simple words also the um, a recent trends on, C, on looking into CBCR we're, we're looking with our whole Latin team into the Latin countries doing TP documentation based on a transactional reality uh, while the tax inspector in Argentina, Chile, uh, Mexico gets uh, gets a copy of the country by country report table one, which is the set of data points which could be read by some tax authorities as the data set relevant for a VCA. Uh, so uh, last but not least, I think the whole trend we, we're seeing about uh, pillar two reporting does put even more emphasis on on uh, the global profit pie and where you're paying what level of tax on, on top of that. So that reporting will even create a, a, a bigger focus where last, um, last point, uh, public CPCR Europe focused might also throw some, uh, some of that materials on the market uh, because you need to publish it on your website. Although the number of variables for now is limited and um, there's a there's a trend to start thinking much more holistic than ever before yeah just to give an example that uh, we have a client who is uh, in the um, in the uh, data centers uh, industry and uh, have a new branch in Israel and uh, for this restructuring um, the uh, the local local advisors um, advised us that the local jurisdictions, actual tax authorities, actually prefer um, the VCA over the transactional approach, especially for the uh, heavy asset and technology integrated business models. And I think that's one of the illustrative examples of the, why the, uh, the VC, the, uh, how the VCA is more and more trendy in the, some local jurisdictions and over the world. Yeah. Okay, very good, uh, Zoe. Uh, next slide, I think. Yep. So this is a happy slide, a sort of a happy slide. So uh, but the, following our discussion just now, uh, we, we fabricated a few uh, segmented PLs. Um, at, at the bottom of this slide, we have uh, a uh, profit pie at the top, and we have the VCA visualization in the middle. So how does this all talk? Uh, we have the global profits. Let's assume it's not allocated like the one here, but it's empty. Uh, you have no clue how to allocate it. Um, you can take the transactional approach, and the transactional approach could be in uh, visualized in either your um, uh, your country by country reporting, and and by the way your country by country reporting PBT line is your starting point per country to calculate your globe income for under your pillar two calculations. So all these tables talk to each other, but let's assume uh, the segmented PL at the bottom is your is is also attached to your local transfer pricing file and therefore uh, is slicing the pie already for you based on stat accounts uh, because in, 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 in your local files you need to at least in, in our approach to trans transactional transfer pricing you need to visualize the segmented uh, uh, profit and loss per type of intercompany transactions and reconcile it to your stat accounts and in in, in your local books. 
then the big question now becomes if you would look at the three uh, entities here involved, and, uh, and and this is the simple version. Uh, you have one entity involved in research and development, which is the first value driver. You have one who's involved in manufacturing, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, you have another one. I don't see it, but it's distribution and marketing, I believe. Uh, so and and the logistics. Uh, we still need another entity for procurement and supply chain. But this sort of is the simple version where purely entity own, only one value driver is relevant. In, in reality, what we see is that the segmented uh, PLs in the local files obviously carry multiple value drivers in them. Uh, one legal entity acts as uh, uh, contract research and development, uh, but uh, uh, is, is a profit center for, for sales and marketing. And uh, th that combination gives you two slices of their profit and loss account, which you need to support in the local file. How does that talk to your value chain and how does that talk to your slicing of the pie at the top? So again, uh, going back to transactional transfer pricing drives your tables at the bottom already today in your local file and that can give you a slice of the pie at the top which is as as visualized but if you would follow the the value chain analysis maybe another outcome is is imminent and more prevailing so how do you deal with the difference uh, that, that is a big question a lot of people are worried about uh, so Again, you go back to the scoring model I explained earlier, and you see what the maturity of data and quantity of data is. You have to do um, a genuine VCA with a high degree of objectivity. Uh, if you can't get there, you're, you're simply not ready for it, then at least you tried it and you should work on a more mature version to get your data pool uh, organized. You need to do that anyhow for your pillar two uh, calculations and your CBCR as I just explained. Uh, so this is not like a nice to have, this in the future will become a need to have as well. Any observations, Amir, Zoe? Yeah, the segmented PNL per value driver. Um, value driver are typically uh, also representing the, the key activities in the group. So I think the, by segmenting the PNL per group entity or the ones that at least contribute the most to the value chain also uh, can give uh, more, relative, more relevant information for the management to understand the, uh, which type of activity brings the most value or which type of activity is not performed as the uh, management expect at the moment. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that, that's mm -hmm. sort of the reality test that we yeah. do with the VCA. We show it to the top management, so CEO, CFO, and COO, and they read it, obviously in a shorter version, then they recognize it. This is how we run the business. Then you mm -hmm. did a good job. Yeah. And if they don't recognize it, probably some part of their activity went wrong, whether it's pricing, whether it's uh, strategy-wise, um, there, there, there is, uh, it's, a, it's a starting point for another round of discussion. Um, and I, th I think this is also more relevant for, especially for the companies have a governance model uh, per activity instead of per region. And I think most of the companies are organized that way. So um, yeah, it's closer to also a governance model by providing an overview of segment PNLs. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. We so, have uh, we have two questions also for the audience. Yeah, this is the point I was making. The bottom of this very full slide. Apologies for 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 that. Uh, but uh, the 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 bottom is the segmented PNL, and and. Who of you does attach the segmented PL to your local TP document? The background of that question is uh, strictly speaking, the regulations uh, of 
um, preparing a local file, a lot of countries have not defined that as a mandatory element uh, directly into the local file. But what you see happening is the combination of files and forms which need to be filed automatically land that segmented PNL uh, with the local tax authorities in almost all the cases we are working on. And if not at the documentation stage, it happens at the controversy stage. Uh, the, the tax authorities simply ask for it. Can we have the votes, Amir? Uh, uh, yeah, just, there. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it, yeah. it's kind of an interesting uh, outcome. 60% uh, is, uh, is, is really trying to tie the knots already at documentation level, while still 40% relies on if we get the question, we answer it upon audit. At least that's my interpretation. Zoe, any, any other comments, observation? Um, this is actually... Um D different from what I what I have uh, experienced from uh, from my practice, I think uh, segmenting PNLs are normally used for uh, profitability review purposes. But as attachment for local files, I do see like the opposite. So forty percent of the clients I worked on have attached segmented PNL as appendix to their local files. To ready to file to the tax authority, and the rest prefer to use their audited uh, financial statements to, to give just a, a whole PNL instead of segmented one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Steve, also some some attendee has asked that uh, they say, I think I missed the explanation. What is the meaning of percentage below each of characterization? This is a question from the audience. Sorry, but can you repeat the question? Uh, yes. What is the meaning of percentage below each of characterization? This is what they... Oh, the percentage of slicing the pie. That is, uh, that's a good question, actually. I should have told that in the beginning. So if the profit pie is EBIT, so operating margin, then the percentage is uh, basically say, in this particular case, sales and marketing gets, 40, gets allocated 40% of the profit. And then I still need to reallocate that 40% of the total of the global profit back to the 40, 40 sales and marketing entities I was talking about in my previous example. Yeah. Any other questions, Amir, from the audience? Um, no, that was the only one. We only have another poll to launch starting from now. So if you use segmented PNLs, if you add all segmented PNLs you attach to all your local files and you add them up, does that reflect your global profit um, you report? Uh, yes or no? So does, does do the numbers tie? Simply said, it, it, if they do, you already have your base version of uh, what we call a PCA light. And, and yes, that could be based on transactional transfer pricing only, but it's, it's a starting point. No? So you at least have the materials, the data points to, uh, to allow you to, uh, to do that global profit segmentation. This is a 50-50 so, so I, I assume the ones with segmented PLs, they they half of them ties it to the total profit pie already. And the other half does not necessarily tie it uh, tie it together to uh, the total profit pie. So it's it's it might be implicit, but they don't make it explicit. So any, any observations here? Um, I wondered the, how the residual profit would land on the 
segmented PNL. That's that's the one element that I can think of as uh, the the reason why people choose no. Yeah. Yeah. You are not not have made the explicit connection between the segmented PNLs, which are just Indeed. seen as a compliance exercise and not so much as a as a performance measurement and then allocation of the total pie into pieces. So, mm -hmm. so it's also looking at it at a holistic level it is not what everyone is, is doing. Yeah. Good. Thank Let's you. move on also in light of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is critical, next slide please. What is critical success factors across industry? So it's the key areas and activities and factors which make an industry successful or not. And, and uh, the critical success factors are highly relevant for the value chain analysis. And they help you to identify the key areas, the organization's value chain are critical to its success. So it's, it's really already starts putting some rating on the, the value drivers in the value chain. So is sales and marketing has the same rating in terms of value driver as your logistics department? Well, if you ask a, a, a traditional company, maybe not, but if you ask Amazon, maybe yes. Uh, maybe even the logistics is more important even. So, so that's, that's also uh, an illustration where critical success factors per industry and then zooming into the critical success factors you, um, your, uh, your company is involved in uh, makes sense because that, that helps you to start doing some weighting of uh, one or more of the value drivers and, and helps you with a more objective base for, for profit splitting, especially the residual profit splitting. Okay. We have some questions. Yes, yeah. Uh, anonymous attendee says, what is the difference between supply chain and value chain analysis? That's a good question. Uh, supply chain is typically the physical flow or, or the flow of, uh, of goods, the physical flow of goods and the, the, the uh, surface um, and, and the way services are being delivered. So that's more the tangible uh, expression of the services or flow of goods. Uh, while value chain is looking at the value creation in each of those steps. You said multiple questions. Is there another one? Um, yeah, there is another remark saying, assume the three entities, R&D, manufacture, marketing, yeah. is all related entities. Do you believe EBIT margin is a robust indicator of of the value added by each party, because in the end, EBIT margins will be determined by the TP policy rather than market forces. Uh, that's that's a very uh, very wise observation. If you use transactional transfer pricing, your EBIT will in, in multinationals who have a lot of cross border flow flow of goods and services and intangibles will will highly depend on the way your transfer pricing is set up. Uh, however, that does not necessarily coincide with how the value, what what the uh, what the involvement of each of the actors in the chain is with one or more of the value drivers, and uh, that that is what VCA does on top of things. So uh, you should look at the the total profit pie and the way it gets sliced by your transactional transfer pricing. That is one exercise. Then you take the total profit pie again, and you look at the value drivers and how each of the actors, the entities, is involved in one, two, three, or five of the value drivers and therefore gets its relevant portion of the total pie. And uh, we see a lot that that analysis is not always one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so uh, the, the EBIT is a proxy but obviously in doing the quantification step one in a VCA, sometimes other metrics are being used in, uh, in allocating 
uh, relevant portion of the profit to the relevant actors. Uh, there could be uh, gross margins, could be return on assets. So it's not uh, fixed that uh, in allocating the EBIT, you always look at the EBIT uh, as, as a predetermined by transactional tra transfer pricing, but you look sometimes at a, a plant making a return on assets and you re calculate what percentage of EBIT that re represents to give you the, the, the quantification step in the profit buy. Okay? Yes. So we'll move on? We can move on, yeah. Yeah, I think we just, uh, there is just one more question came in. Uh, uh, we have a question. Do you have example of critical performance indicators? Uh, critical performance indicators. Um, yeah. I guess critical success factors in this case. Yeah, critical success yeah. factors. We we will illustrate a few in the, the upcoming case study slot. So let's take them yeah. uh, into account. Um, this is uh, an example from the mining industry. So you see at the top, you see the value drivers. Um, this, this is based on a booklet uh, which uh, is titled uh, Transfer Pricing in the Mining Industry in Africa, which is published by the World Bank. So they have in an objective way say, okay, this is the critical success factors uh, in, the, in, in the, this is the value drivers in the mining industry. And uh, you can zoom in uh, by starting to weight which of the value drivers is, is, has a higher weight than the other. Uh, and then you get to the critical success factors in the mining industry uh, with the support functions on top of that. Um, this uh, then leads to uh, the, the slicing of the pie uh, as indicated and this is just for illustration purposes so uh, the cases we've worked on the numbers obviously are 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 different but this just gives you an idea on uh, what we do we look at not only the transactional transportation but we look at the critical success factors in the mining industry we have handbooks confirming that we look at the multinational and how much uh, we should weight one uh, value driver higher than the other and uh, then link it to people, um, but also link it to assets. And uh, this is where a critical success factor in the mining industry is obviously running the mining assets, uh, running the mine and the mining assets to get um, the, the commodities uh, out, of, uh, out of the mine. And uh, typically to, to measure the performance of the, the one who is carrying the majority of the assets in the mining industry, in this case, the fixed assets, uh, the, the performance measurement and the benchmark, the mark to market we are using in that particular case is a ROA, return on, on fixed assets, that is not on, on total assets, but on fixed assets. So that is a measurement to say, okay, uh, if this is the return on assets in the mining industry, that helps us to carve out, to quantify one bit of the total profit uh, based on that performance index, which is um, mark to market because we have materials, we have data sets uh, in the mining industry, which helps us to make that objective uh, enough to apply it on the step one quantification of the one who's running the, the fixed assets. So that's an illustration of a performance uh, indicator for, in this case, the owner of the mining assets. Um, maybe in the next slide. We have a question regarding the last slide. Um, how is 5%, the last slide, please. How is 5% allocated to licensing and the ex uh, exploration? And for that, how, uh, for that matter, how do you decide on the percentage of allocation? Yeah, this is an outcome of uh, what is a typical license, what is the value driver uh, licensing and exploration 
mean and uh, depends on what type of mining assets you're looking at and what the frequency of renewal of the mi mining license is and what activities are involved and what whether you consider this to be and that that's always a discussion with uh, with uh, the tax authorities whether this license to operate is uh, uh, simply a license to operate with with cost and administrative cost and some degree of um, how do you say it? some degree of critical success factor or are we looking at a license and exploration as a genuine intangible uh, because if it's a genuine intangible you would uh, probably look be looking maybe at the at the much bigger slice of the pie being allocated to uh, to that value driver in this uh, specific case so yeah. first the, the 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 depending on the commodity you need to see what the role of that value driver is and uh, whether it's a critical success factor with a high weight or a lower weight or an average weight, and then you need to come up with the mark to market and then see how much of the total pie it, it consumes and, uh, and absorbs. But certainly, if you just look at the license to operate and see that as an administrative process, then you're at the low end of the, the, the pie, uh, size of the pie, if you see it as a, the biggest intangibles with being the highest and most important critical success factor, then obviously it will eat up a much larger portion of this uh, profit point. Yeah, the the audience has a follow up question to ask whether uh, we're saying all these percentage allocations are subjective. So my uh, answer will be the starting point. It will be ob uh, objective of economic analysis for this industry. Yeah. Use the public domain information, also the statistics uh, data from the databases to analyze this industry to find out what are the value drivers uh, that are most uh, correlated to the value creation period. We can use uh, um, use EBIT, for example, or gross margin, or profit. Bef sorry, profit before tax is not a good indication, but EBIT, for example. As uh, uh, as the factor to see what are the other factors to de to describe this uh, EBIT, and that's a process that we will uh, introduce more in the VCA 3.0 as well. Yeah, correct. And and it's just another illustration on sales and marketing. Uh, if you if you sell uh, co highly commoditized uh, uh, mining assets, um, uh, the true commodities which are are traded on exchanges with uh, a lot of uh, price points in, the, in the, from the exchange, then then the, the, the value add by the sales team is and the marketing team is relatively limited because your price is predetermined by the stock, by the exchange on which the commodities get traded. If on the other side you're running you're running a mine on uh, on diamonds. And suddenly, the the whole sales and marketing becomes a very uh, you you need you need to drive the sales and marketing. You need to listen to the market how they want to polish that that uh, diamond uh, and, and to get to to get to the highest price by the market. And then suddenly, sales and marketing becomes very uh, a much more value creation um, a part of the value drivers and has a high critical success factor element to it. There's one uh, page in, the, in that uh, World Bank mining book which explains that type of uh, critical success factors per type of mining uh, commodity. So, okay, shall we move on? Yeah. Uh, chemical industry, uh, pretty Pretty much the same here. We 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 linked it uh, the number one, two, three, and four, and five to functions, risks, and assets. So this is uh, a table uh, which is illustrated for the the chemical industry. Again, chemical industry uh, is is sometimes very different. If you if you sell high volumes, uh, standard commoditized chemical products, then the sales function might uh, might get 
as part of the EBIT might get 1% or even less um, versus if, if you have special, specialized chemicals, uh, the, the role of the sales and marketing might se uh, se severely get upgraded to even uh, 5% of, of, uh, of the EBIT line. Uh, so, so this is where, where obviously the critical success factors in the chemical industry and what rating you give to it is already depending on uh, am I in the commoditized version of the, of the chemical industry or am I in the specialized chemicals, which even in some cases uh, make it all the way to pharma, uh, to chemical compound of uh, uh, FDA-approved drugs. Uh, so you go into the extreme in, uh, in, that, in that case. But that, that's the type of analysis uh, which is relevant. And, and here the question is what has changed in the critical success factors in the industry. You saw a lot of consolidation in the bulk chemicals um, and you saw a lot of companies trying to sell the bulk chemicals to the aggregators in the industry and try to make their way into specialty chemicals. Why? Because simply the margin expectation in specialty chemicals was a lot higher and therefore also the the, the, the critical success factors in, the, in specialized chemicals is a different one from bulk chemicals. Uh, so another example for illustration uh, purposes. Let's move on. Fast fashion, I think uh, everyone knows the fast fashion by looking at the high streets, but the more and more fast fashion is not only uh, uh, the brick and mortar companies. Uh, what has really changed in terms of critical success factors in this industry is uh, omni-channel. So uh, after Corona, a lot of this has gone online and you get uh, uh, shop roaming, uh, web roaming, uh, the, the first customer visits the website, goes into the store, the second goes into the store and then while walking out the store uh, orders the, the, the goods because they don't want to carry it home. So there's an omni-channel change and that has a huge impact on the critical success, the success factors in this industry. So the question, what do you believe are the three critical success factors uh, for the apparel industry? Brand recognition, marketing and promotion, trend forecasting, yeah, efficient supply chain. Uh, so it's it's cost management. I think uh, more and more, if you move from if you use to bricks and you move to clicks or to a big big percentage of clicks becoming relevant, then obviously cost management is uh, is going to be the key. In the, in the light of the conversion. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I tend to agree with uh, the higher ranked B and E being a, a big critical success factor in that industry. And that puts a rating on these elements. Huh? So all these value drivers you see on the slide. Very good, in light of time, let's move on. couple of uh, visualization techniques. Um, we, we like to talk to boards by showing them the, uh, the gross margin, operating margin, and FTEs. But in, in essence, we typically add sales and, um, and uh, uh, the, the tax paid to, the, to these uh, pie charts and talk to the board about whether they recognize this geographical slicing of their sales, gross margin, uh, operating margin, uh, FTEs and tax paid uh, as their business. Uh, so it gives them a very business feel like discussion and not a tax related discussion. So if they don't recognize it, you already have a problem in the way you report.
support your uh, global profits. The next uh, technique on the next page is a, t a more traditional one where you take the value chain and you try to lock it to functions, people, risks, and assets, where here the assets are technology-related intangible, strategic, or marketing intangible, more operational. So this is then also uh, requires a link to the ultimate entity. So this is a combination of your traditional approach with the value chain approach and unlocking and, and marrying the two into one analysis. Uh, next slide is a, is a quantification of what, how you can quantify the total pie based on the previous slide. So it gives you the carve outs uh, you're all aware of, and it gives you at the end an IP owner and a matchmaker, which on one side is an investment center, attracting a portion of the residual, and on the other side, there's a profit center, uh, also attracting a bigger chunk, typically, of the residual, um, and that needs to be translated to the entities again. So this is a combination of quantification and allocation as we started off with. We move to slide three. This is a, a way the, the board typically looks at their own strategy and translates their strategy into a business model canvas. Uh, so it would be very key if you do a VCA that you also sync uh, your VCA analysis with the business model canvas your, your board has come up with recently. Um, because that those two are are almost the same uh, components that should carry the same components so uh, and and really anchoring it into your strategy and business model canvas is is really helping you to drive tax and tax risk management forward a lot better than than ever before next slide uh, key takeaways and sorry we overrun a little bit our time slot um, it's still a balancing act between, oh, can we, can we have that later, that question? I'm yeah, to sure. Do the key takeaways. So a balancing act between transactional TP and VCA. Um, there is references and they are providing solid an anchors. Um, so how reliable is it? Well, we've shown you the OECD criteria with uh, more than six years of VCA experience, I think VCA is here to stay and a, a data-driven business model, um, uh, yeah, will already have a lot of um, uh, a quantitative VCA in it. And also uh, if we see the apparel industry moving more and more to uh, a digital twin analysis uh, using uh, the platform economy to grow its business, uh, this this is delivering a lot of data points to apply a decent VCA. Um, and VCA is the only link, only dynamic link between on one side strategy and business model in your tax and TP setup. And then last but not least, one last question, if you bear with us uh, for one minute, and then uh, thank you for your attention. So this is to see how many people we convey to rethink the no and the, the first uh, question. Uh, we, we're obviously believers of VCA, so, but uh, it would be interesting to see uh, the, the audience, its uh, response on this one. Um, meanwhile, we, we will run in April um, a VCA based on uh, m and &E specific data, so we call VCA 2.0, which is quantitative VCA, mostly on data driven, and VCA 3.0 uh, on the whole industry data set uh, will be run in May, so please uh, uh, make sure you're, um, you're registered for those uh, subsequent VCA sessions. Yes, for design, implementation, documentation, all of the above. So one third uses it for all um, different people for different purposes. And uh, at least the ones who stayed online, only 8% know. Pretty good score. So yeah. 
thanks for your attention and uh, enjoy your day. Uh, thanks, uh, Zoe and uh, me. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a nice Bye. day. Bye.